Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our sixth annual Steps to Wellness. Uh, for those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Don Savoy, and I'm the president and CEO of Meridian. Um, you know, I came to Meridian in 2011, and part of the reason why I came here was the staff. Uh, you know, you look over the last 50 years, and you know there are thousands of folks that have worked at Meridian, but they've they've served well over 100,000 folks in our community. If you look at the numbers, if you look at the uh, the data. Um, we've served over 100,000 people and in a radius of about six, 600, a little over 600,000 residents. So when you, when you do the math on that, we've made an incredible commitment and, and made a difference in people's lives, saved lives in the community. And that's the thousands of staff that work at Meridian. They make a difference every day. They don't do it alone. They do it with partners. And we've, we've seen our partnerships work. Without partnerships, honestly, our community is not strong. So that focus has got us there. The past 50 years, um, I like to say that it's been exceptional, it's been growing, but it is our past. The past is written. Um, you know, when we think about today, and I'll talk just a little bit about that, you know, we have uh, seen through the pandemic, but Meridian never really decreased in services. We have innovation and we have things that have allowed us to care for our, our citizens, our family, our friends, um, as we've dealt with the last few years. And now we're expanding into Putnam County and into Marion County, and there's a lot of important reasons for that. There are gaps in healthcare in those communities, but also the folks from those communities are coming to Gainesville and coming to Lake City and our other offices, which take up access and availability, not to mention that transportation is one of the number one barriers we face. So as we expand, it's not sort of a franchise, it's we expand out and we grow up. Um, so you see Lake City and Gainesville really become hubs of excellence for innovation regarding health care. Um, as we look to the future, you know, I mentioned already that the, the past is sort of in the books, as they say. You know, I look at all of you in the smiling faces. You're all part of our community, and you are part of Meridian. You're part of making a difference. We can't do it alone. We'll never do it alone. But as we all work together, we're able to meet the needs of the community and, and quite frankly, save lives and, and promote wellness within families within our community. So, you know, one of the things that I just want to touch on is uh, here in Alachua County and for the surrounding counties is the central receiving system. In April or May, we're going to be breaking ground on an expansion of Meridian's crisis support emergency and uh, inpatient. Why? Because there have been four or five receiving facilities to serve this county and this region, but they're not coordinated well. So you might see readmissions, you might see other things happen. You see longer lengths of stay because it's hard to understand what medications work for an individual. But this project that we're, that's standing up didn't happen from Meridian. It happened from, by folks like um, Commissioner Hutchinson in the past, uh, Mayor Poe and now and uh, also uh, Sadie Darnell. But as we move forward, you know, we have uh, the sheriff, we have Mary Helen Wheeler, we have uh, Stuart Wagner, others. They made this happen. They championed this because they saw the need in the community. And Meridian is just the vehicle to get it done. Um, this is gonna be a real important thing for our community in the near future mm -hmm. and as we move forward. I can't tell you how excited I am about being able to coordinate care and uh, get someone to their doctor, understand what medications they're on, be able to de-escalate the crisis that they're facing, and also have walking capabilities 24-7 for folks that are in more mild crises but perceived crises. These things don't happen on an eight to five Monday to Friday basis. So we've made a lot of changes, but we got a lot more to go, and the future is unwritten. So when we look forward to, to the future, the next 50 years of Meridian, one of the things that I'm most excited about, and I am, I'm very optimistic, is the, what our future is gonna look like, what our community is gonna look like. And it only happens with collaboration and all of you, and 100 times all of you, making a difference within our community. Um, we play our role, we play our part, we like to think that, that uh, we do a good job, we can always do it better. Uh, but as we look forward, um, we hope to see all of these faces be part of changing the health, wellness uh, of our community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. And I just want to say again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for caring about the, the mental health and wellness of our community and being part of our community. Thank you.
How long did it take to memorize that? Because I'm looking for my teleprompter and I'm not seeing it. I'm not sure what to do without that. Like, okay, uh, great, done, thank you. My name is David Snyder, I'm with... I really need one of those shirts with the logo upside down so I can read. I'm with WCJV TV 20 here in Gainesville, and I'm very, very happy to be a part of this again. Something somebody asked me, they said, um, would, uh, would everybody turn off the phones, off the, the ringers for me? Um, reason is we love hearing all the different ringers. We do. I mean, and at work, it's really great. There's some unnamed person who sits next to me every night who has a ringer that has something to do with James Bond and 007. And, and that is, it's awesome. Um, <coughs> but this probably isn't the place to hear it. So I set mine on vibrate. I don't know what you set yours on. Anyway, so um, uh, this says that I'm supposed to say good afternoon. I am pleased to welcome you to Meridian's sixth annual Steps to Wellness Family Impact Edition in the beautiful Best Western Gateway Grant. We have some, I mean, well, first of all, let me back up. All of you are VIPs. All of you who support Meridian, all of you who support uh, the cause of positive mental health. Uh, you're all celebrities in, in my mind. Uh, we do have some dignitaries who we'd like to recognize as well, uh, beginning with Alachua County Sheriff Clovis Watson. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Former Eighth Circuit State Attorney Bill Cervone, we did not forget you, sir. In retirement, glad you're here. And County Commissioner Mary Helen Wheeler. Welcome. So as you know, Hurricane Ian uh, forced us all to postpone uh, steps to wellness along with a lot of other things. Now, traditionally it's scheduled for September's National Recovery Month. Uh, we hope you and your family certainly weathered that storm. And then of course we had another one. I mean, one week ago, we we're all scrambling because of yet another storm. Can you believe it? It's been quite a year. Um, the weather though today feels, for somebody from Michigan, this feels just like September, so um, I'm rolling with it just fine. I'm ready for some uh, apple cider and a, a cider mill and some donuts. That's the way we roll in Michigan. Um, the month of September is designated as National Recovery Month. It's an annual observance that aims to raise awareness about the importance of recovery and to show appreciation about the importance of recovery and the service providers and community members, not just here in North Central Florida, but all over the country who work tirelessly to make recovery possible in its many forms. Meridian has certainly helped thousands of people across North Central Florida improve their quality of life, which is one of the reasons I'm proud to support Meridian and be the guest MC at today's, that's what I'm doing, okay. <laughs> I love this thing here. Let me let me do this. What do you think? <laughs> now, now you know why that's there. I'm just kidding, Eliza. Sorry. I was asked to make a couple of comments why I'm passionate about uh, the the cause of mental health of of, of helping people because it's a uh, it's. I'm an appropriate choice to talk about this. Just watch my newscasts. You know, you, you realize this guy probably needs help. But, uh, and, the, and, the, and the fact is that I went for several years with voices in my head telling me what to do. And, and it took years to realize that was the director, that was the producer, that was the reporters are talking in my earpiece. So those, you know, I realized they were, uh, pointing me in the right direction. They were telling me the right things to do. So these are these are appropriate voices in my head, right? Um, sometimes, of course, there are wrong voices and they lead us all astray. They take us to dark places, the wrong places. And we need, um, I think everybody needs a little help, a little somebody, a little something, whatever. Um, and I liken it for myself to a four-legged chair now, and, and this, I, I tend to joke a lot, this is serious to me. And I realize this analogy has probably been used many, many times, and, 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 but it's true for me. And that is, uh, for stability in my life, I, I need good physical health, and I have a great general practitioner, great uh, primary care physician, Siggy Schmidt, um, my family, uh, my faith, um, but also uh, the support of a counselor. 
Uh, I've seen Steve Figley, who's a longtime uh, counselor here in Gainesville, for almost 10 years now, and we meet every Tuesday. Um, there was a book um, written a number of years ago uh, by a columnist, Mitch Album, uh, called Tuesdays with Maury. Um, for me, it's uh, Tuesdays with Steve or Tuesdays with Figley or whatever you, you want to call it. But it, it, that's been immensely important for me um, to maintain mental health, even if it, I hadn't been struggling with anything in particular. The kind of work that I do, the kind of work that many of you do, um, you're put into contact with difficulties and with darkness that you have to learn to cope with and and you have to learn to deal with. I mean, the things that we report so often are just uh, ugly and negative. And people ask us, why are you constantly talking about bad news? Man, I don't want to um, because it can get to you after a while. So anyhow, uh, for me personally, having Steve in my life has been uh, an enormous blessing that has changed the trajectory of my life and I'm very grateful for him and I'm not shy to talk about the fact that um, he doesn't charge me as much anymore <laughs> because we're such good friends now Steve and I sometimes we lean on on other things you know instead of that stability you know we've we've got crutches we all have you know, well many of us did or have or whatever I mean whether or not it be something illicit like alcohol or, or pornography or if it's something like work like workaholics you know we know people who do that and and they they focus and they just put too much of their own um, self-worth maybe into other things into wrong things um, and so we need we need the help to to restore the four at least with me some people might need five or 17 legs to their chair but i need those four in order to maintain my stability my my stability i can't think of a better way of putting it in order to be stable and to be firm in what i do and in living my life and so of course the thing that i love is that for so many people meridian is that fourth leg of the chair and provides that stability that otherwise uh, would find people toppling over and uh, and and that's why i'm grateful that they asked me to be a part of this um and and to show a little support i i don't know why they chose me in the first place uh, a number of years ago other than they they felt sorry for me and but i'm grateful that they let me be here and, and be a part of this and to do this now so thank you also uh, for supporting this event and meridian's mission to promote health care recovery and well-being for those who are affected by mental illness and substance abuse disorders through prevention coordinated treatment and supportive services um, we also want to thank our sponsors and the partners who helped to make this event possible today including our platinum partner vistar credit union and our yes indeed why not vistar thank you for your support and our gold partners, GRU Gainesville Regional Utilities, Assured Partners, Infotech, and Maggie Labarda and John Cherry. So thank you to our gold partners. Uh, much further down, the I'm on the list of the rust partners. I, I, you gotta go a long ways down. But we wanna thank also our silver, our bronze patr and patron sponsors, our supporters and of course, all of you who joined us today, thank you all so much. We uh, want to remind you to uh, visit 32 auctions to bid on the silent auction items. Uh, there's some great items over there to support Meridian's client services. And you can find QR codes at your table. They're right on the centerpieces. Um, they took their centerpiece home with them already, <laughs> evidently. Oh no, they have theirs. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and the uh, QR code's back at the display table. If you haven't seen it, it's back near the back oh, on that side. Um, Meridian staff will contact the auction winners um, to arrange for pickup. And the auction closes, I'm told, Thursday, November 24th at midnight. So Thanksgiving at midnight, you, your Black, shopping or Black Friday shopping is done if you uh, <laughs> get items through that. 
Next in the program, I'd, I'd like you to welcome, please, uh, Alan Pullen. He's Meridian's Senior Vice President of Clinical and Community Services. In 1997, he joined Meridian as a children's case manager. He rose to SVP in 2019. He's a member and trainer with the Drug Endangered Children Task Force and is a mental health first aid youth and adult instructor. Please welcome once again, Alan Pollan. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that. Okay, I am tall, so here we go. So, let's face it. Life is tough. It's full of obstacles, challenges, ups and downs. We can be riding high in April, only to be knocked down in May. It's safe to say, life is certainly not predictable along the way. And why would it be? We spin around on a round ball, earth, as it works its way around a fiery ball, sun, once a year. And for good measure, Earth, our home, wobbles every 26,000 years. Musicians, artists, poets express to us life's hardships, our, its beauty, our laments, our kindness or cruelty, forgiveness or lack thereof, disappointments and successes, and most importantly, how to do the funky chicken, all right? <laughs> Comedians give us insight as well. And I wish I was one, just couldn't pull that off. <clears throat> as enriching and critical as the arts are for the human experience, we are not only familiar with what is expressed through these art forms, we play them out routinely. Given this, I'd like to it would be of service to take a step back, to take a look at what we contend with from the beginning. In utero, we're at the mercy of our environment. Let's hope the world around us is providing us adequate nutrition and minimal stress to allow us to develop into cute little humans, also known as babies <laughs> at nine months. We know that chronic stressors and or lack of adequate nutrition introduces risks for a myriad of issues, including low birth weight, respiratory issues, irritability, sleep problems, and overall temperament. Now in this new life, everyday experiences and connections are sent to the infant's brain through all of the senses. Sight, sounds, taste, smells, touch, balance, and movement interplay with the world, creating and adding to their abilities. With a safe, secure, and nurturing environment, we're on the path to reach expected developmental milestones. Sitting, standing, walking, talking, parents do their best, and most quite well, fostering a loving, safe, and predictable environment. Though when children are exposed to adverse events, high levels of ongoing stress negatively affect a child's brain development, immune systems, and stress response systems. These changes can affect attention, decision-making, and learning, exposure to violence, abuse, neglect, and other traumatic incidents leaves lasting negative effects on one's health, overall well-being, socialization, education, and job performance, and even influences parenting when one has their own children. Research and the associated long-term studies about adverse childhood experiences tell us this. <clears throat> As we slowly separate for periods of time from our primary bonding figures, children begin to develop a sense of self, an integral part of their social emotional development. Experience, culture, and relationships with adults are major influence, influences on this process. As time passes, the sense of self encompasses self-esteem, self-worth, identity, and self-image. It is a combination of the way we see ourselves, our experiences, our environments, and how we feel about ourselves. For children and adolescents, a sense of self 
is linked to their developing identities, which become increasingly independent from their families. So now we've reached the teen years. Do we have any teenagers in the room by any chance? All right, there we go. Subject matter expert all the way. Still live in those glory years, right? Never give it up, ever. There you go. Okay. So, I thought we would kind of be safe, but we do have a teenager. Anyone parenting teenagers in the room? Oh, yeah, we got. Would anybody like to share? No, just kidding, just kidding. Maybe later, right? Maybe later. In all seriousness, the adolescent period is a very challenging time for youth given the significant changes occurring. Emotionally, mood shifts quickly and are felt more intensely. There's also an increase in risk taking and impulsive behavior. Changes in hormones, changes in height and weight, mental challenges include development of more abstract thinking skills, use of logic and reason, a heightened focus on physical concerns, formation of their own beliefs, which may not align with their family values and beliefs, and the classic, for the ages, questioning of authority. This folds into the changes socially of experimentation with different levels of social and cultural identity, an increase in peer influence, and learning how to manage relationships. Quite a tall order, I think we can all agree. The good news is most youth, with proper support, pass through adolescence successfully despite all the challenges. To that note, positive, involved parenting is critical all the way through, even though it may not be received that way at times by the youth. And certainly honorable mentions go out to teachers, coaches, extended family, and others in a mentor role. We hope because well, excuse me. So for a breather, we hopefully have some weekends, right? It's pretty serious so far. I know I got you got on a serious route. Uh, we got some weekends, hopefully some fun, maybe some time with no homework or worrying about upcoming tests, and then hopefully a nice summer vacation. Because what comes up next? Young adulthood, mm -hmm. dedicating to a vocation or continuing education, and in many circumstances working along with these commitments then odds are parenting comes into play. Certainly a unique set of challenges, we can all agree. And then on the career path, we visit the questions, are we satisfied with our career? Are we, can we earn enough for our immediate and upcoming needs? Are we on path for future financial security? Etc. Cetera, et cetera. Rolling into middle age, life is certainly playing itself out. Ongoing challenges and pressures are our constant companion. As they have taken residence with us, we strive, hope the positives are taking precedence, and we have healthy coping mechanisms for what comes our way. We also may be in a sandwich situation, caring for our children and supporting and caring for our parents in their later years. And of course, as our years accumulate, we have our own later stages of aging. So in short, all the genetic, environmental, situational, and unforeseen events are handed to us routinely without us even asking, I might add. So I don't know about everybody here, but I'm exhausted just thinking about all of that. So it certainly is and will continue to be quite the journey. With all those challenges, we have to ask, what motivates us? What keeps us going? Abraham Maslow, a renowned American psychologist, explained that people are innately motivated to achieve certain needs, with some needs taking precedent over others. If you've taken an introduction to psychology class, maybe, got a few in here. Okay, you may remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maggie, I know you do. <laughs> that was the one where core elements of the theory are represented inside a pyramid. And I'm sure it was on your test. I'm sure you got it right, right? But either way, let's refresh. Maslow stated with and for our existence, the most basic need is for our physical survival. 
Once that level is fulfilled, the next level up is what motivates us. Each hierarchy of need dictates an individual's behavior. The five needs, I'm gonna run through them quickly. The five needs are working from the bottom to the top of the pyramid. First, as mentioned, physiological needs. The most basic human survival needs. Food and water, sufficient rest, clothing and shelter, overall health and reproduction. Next up, safety needs. This includes emotional stability and well-being, health and financial security, and protection from violence and theft. Climbing up in the middle of the pyramid, number three, love and belonging needs. Includes friendships and family bonds, parents, siblings, children, and chosen family, spouses and partners. Physical and emotional intimacy achieves a feeling of elevated kinship. Additionally, membership in social groups contributes to meeting this need. From belonging to a team of coworkers, forging an identity in a club, union, or group of hobbyists. We're almost to the top. Number four, esteem needs primarily speaks to self-respect, the belief that you are valuable and deserving of dignity, and self-esteem, confidence in your potential for personal growth and accomplishments. Self-confidence and independence follow meeting these needs. Now, reaching the top of the pyramid, yeah, drum roll, anybody? I can do it, oh, I can do it up here. Thank you. Self-actualization needs. Self-actualization describes the fulfillment of your potential as a person. It includes education and skill development and the refining of talents in many areas, such as music, athletics, design, cooking, gardening, and caring for others, and broader goals like learning a new language, traveling to new places, or winning awards, or being recognized for your accomplishments. So, it really does appear we are designed to evolve and grow step by step constantly striving, seeking to fulfill different needs, and ultimately, hopefully, leading us to a fulfilling life. And I, well, I'm seeing something now. There's a higher level, sorry about that. This is confusing. I thought we were done, right? So later in Maslow's career, he introduced a new motivation called self-transcendence. One component being a cause beyond the self, which may involve service to others, devotion to an ideal such as truth or art, or a cause like social justice, environmentalism, the pursuit of science, or religious faith. But we'll have to leave expanding on self-transcendence for another day. Sorry about that, it's probably just getting interesting for a few. So now that you all are thinking of ways to work to the top of the pyramid, or maintain your self-actualized or self-transcendent state, I feel comfortable, comfortable to pivot here to discuss practical steps to help ourselves and others on their journey, especially when somebody is struggling. We know, we've heard, we understand, self-care is paramount. You know yourself best, you know what you enjoy, what relaxes you, what invigorates you, and you know new ideas and tips are easily found on Google. <laughs> now, for the sake of not being relying on everything for the Google, we have placed a list of enjoyable coping activities for you at your table, for your reference at your leisure. Many activities listed will be familiar, some you may have forgotten about, some may be something new you would like to try to keep up your well-being which in and of itself, we know, is so very, very important. And how well you care for your well-being is commensurate with your ability to help others. And helping others is how I would like to finish out here. Life's obstacles present in a not if, but when format. Depending on how often and how intense life scenarios present, we may or may not be equipped at the time to work through them without help. So how do we check in and start the conversation when we are concerned about someone? With simple phrases stated in a genuine and caring manner. How are you? Are you okay? 
Something seems to be bothering you. Would you like to talk about it? You don't seem yourself lately. Is there anything happening that you would like to talk about? These are great first steps. Now let's address listening. The importance of being a good listener cannot be understated. Okay? I've got to say it one more time. The importance of being a good listener cannot be understated. And the reason I said it twice <laughs> is because the importance of being a good listener cannot be understated. So, sorry. <laughs> okay. So have you ever been in a conversation when you wondered if the other person was even listening, understood or even cared about what you were saying, kept glancing at their phone, seemed like they were in a hurry? It makes you want to quickly end that encounter. So let's avoid that scenario especially when helping, as it could lead to a missed opportunity to assist someone in need. We can listen, nod encouragingly, provide comfortable eye contact, be accepting, and at times repeat back or paraphrase what has been said. All of this lets one know you really hear them and understand what they are conveying. In this, you are listening to understand, not respond. A good listener can be comfortable not knowing what they're going to say next. For most, it is our second nature to respond. And because, got a lot of overachievers here, we will also quickly come up with a solution, right? Or many solutions, right on the spur of the moment because we know everything and we know how to fix everything. Well, this is well intended, but it is ineffective. Listening to understand is the best chance for someone struggling to open up to you. Now, because you were a good listener and asked relevant questions for clarity, you likely learned how frequent and how long these problems have been occurring. What has been the impact on their health their daily activities, relationships, school or work, enabling you to reach an appropriate level of concern. This is a good time to provide reassurance. Saying phrases such as, breakups can be tough, it's natural for you to be hurt and upset. As opposed to, I remember my first breakup, here's what you need to do, All right? <laughs> Do say, if I'm here for you, if you want to talk. There are also people who are trained to help you work through these feelings. Do not say, you really need to talk to a counselor about that. Okay. Right? That one's, you're going to lose them. Hopefully not. Do say, you are not alone. Avoid, don't say, you'll get over it. Don't just worry about it so much. Guilty, I think everyone's probably guilty on some level of that. So for some scenarios, a supportive conversation may be the extent of that interaction and it's helpful in and of itself. Or it could lead to checking in on them later or being an ongoing support depending on your role and relationship with them. It may lead to providing practical assistance to help them access a professional. Now, as the level of concern rises, so does our involvement. Of the most concerning would be someone with suicidal thoughts. This is where using the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline number 988, everyone got the 988, okay? Reaching out to Alachua County Crisis Center or Meridian is appropriate. Now to build on these approaches, we strongly recommend taking a mental health first aid class. These classes were developed for persons not in the mental health field to be effective helpers. And of course, the more effective we are at helping, the better our community is equipped to help others on their journey to their true potential. Thank you for being here today and supporting Meridian.
Thank you, Alan. That was great. Uh, good words, things to remember. Um, I was with you right up to everybody has to be a good listener, but then after that, I'm just kidding, it was good. But it's a little known fact that in Maslow's hierarchy of needs that on his deathbed, he said that self-transcendence is actually reached when you watch the TV 20 news at six and then tell the Nielsen ratings people that you watch the TV 20 news at six. I'm sorry, I had to get that in there. Everybody, Leslie Carney speaks on the importance of elevating the conversation about mental health by sharing her experiences with her son's diagnosis of schizophrenia. Over 15 years, she's advocated for him and other family members in similar situations. Coming from a position of hope, Leslie encourages having open and honest conversations about mental health and the value that mental disorders offer when we allow ourselves to be transformed by them. Please welcome Leslie Carney. I sure will. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me here and allowing me this opportunity to share my one small part of my experience with raising my son, Aaron, who has schizophrenia. Imagine hearing voices you couldn't quiet. Can you, everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Imagine seeing things no one else saw. Imagine sharing your thoughts, but others said you made no sense. How would you feel? Imagine behaving in ways that attracted attention. What would you do? Imagine having an illness, such as schizophrenia. Who would you be? What would you think? Where would you go? How would you feel? What would you do? Who would you be? That's a lot to think about. And I'll tell you this much, you would be exactly who you are right now. Not a statistic in a database, a consumer at a mental health facility, or a client in a program. You would be you, a mother, a father, a sister or brother, daughter or son. It's important that you understand this because what I've experienced is that the mental health world tends to strip people of their identity and dignity, making them believe that all that they are is their diagnosis. My son Aaron was diagnosed with schizophrenia at the age of 12. It was a life-changing event on many levels. Our world as we knew it vanished. We went from having an intelligent, athletic, and outgoing child to a socially withdrawn, emotionally flat, and inter internally afflicted son. There was no twinkle in his eye, no furrow of his brows, no wincing of his face or pursing of his lips. There was a vacantness that made him appear unrecognizable to us. My family and I collapsed into a state of despondency and apathy that no amount of well wishes were enough to raise our spirits. Our world as we once knew was over. Fear of the unknown along with a herd of predacious thoughts consumed our household like a pack of lions devouring their prey. The sharp, jagged nature of the illness tore our parts apart and shredded our 
spirits to pieces. We were lost, confused, sad, angry, and frustrated. We were suffering, so much so we didn't know what to do next. Can you imagine the helplessness we were experiencing or can you relate to it at all? I'm sure you can because what I want you to know is that it is at this juncture where our twisted, gnarly, and rugged paths intersect, where they overlap and momentarily become familiar territory to us all. It is at this level we come to understand each other, to discover who we are and what we are capable of in the face of adversity. Nelson Mandela said it so eloquently, our human compassion binds us one to the other, not in pity or patronizingly, but as human beings who have learnt how to turn our common suffering into hope for the future. You don't need to have a friend or loved one with a mental illness to understand what they or their family is going through. You just need to have a willingness to listen, to care, and to understand on the level of where our commonality as human beings meet. With that said, when Aaron was diagnosed in 2003, I didn't know anything about mental illness. At least that's what I thought. Until I realized that I'd been conditioned to believe what I saw in the movies, heard on the news, or read in the paper. Those unconscious beliefs influenced my reality at the time which in turn affected how I felt about Aaron's diagnosis. Despondency became a bedfellow I couldn't escape from because truth be told, I didn't want to accept that he had schizophrenia. That was not a world I wanted to be a part of. As a result, I decided to get a second opinion. I had him evaluated by some of the best research doctors in early childhood schizophrenia. And after a full day of testing, they confirmed my worst fear. He did indeed have the illness. However, just before leaving the office, the team of doctors emphasized one last thing. They said, a third of the individuals with this illness will stay the same. A third will get better and a third will get worse. And we don't know which third your son will be in but statistically, because of the early onset of the disease, his prognosis isn't good. His prognosis isn't good? That was the last thing I heard and the first thing I thought about when we got in the car to leave. On the drive home, I kept looking at Aaron in the rearview mirror as he thrashed about and pounded his fist into the back seat, screaming and yelling at the voices in his head. I couldn't imagine a suffering greater than one in which you lose your mind 
Because when you lose your mind, you lose the essence of who you are. It was the longest three hour drive of my life during which time I thought to myself, can I live with him like this if he stayed the same? Can I live with him if he gets worse? How about if he gets better? Can he even get better? I mulled over those questions right up to the time I pulled into our driveway, at which point I decided he was going to be amongst the third that got better. I didn't know how he was going to get better. All I knew was that I couldn't live with the other alternatives. He had to get better. And so began our journey to wellness. The decision to get him well was the catalyst for hope to emerge. And let's not underestimate the power of hope. According to Desmond Tutu, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. Charles Spurgeon agrees, having said, hope itself is like a star, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity, but only to be discovered in the night of adversity. And boy, did we have a lot of nightly adversities. Over the years, I encountered many well-intentioned people offering advice suggestions, and even predictions of Aaron's outcome in life, all devoid of the one thing I needed most, hope. Hope that he would be all right, that I would be all right. Sometimes we talk about hope in a trite or cavalier way, forgetting that hope is the very lifeline we all need when there's nothing left to hold on to. It doesn't matter if we've experienced a death in the family, the loss of a job or a mental illness diagnosis. At the end of the day, we all want the comfort of knowing that we are not alone and that everything's going to be all right. After all, hope never fades. If you think you have lost hope, it's only because it's been eclipsed by fear. What I know for sure is that hope is the promise of things to come. It's the emphatic, undoubtable belief that what you want to see happen is possible. Hope guides our steps. It lights our paths and inspires new ideas. It was a defining moment when I decided that Aaron would be amongst the third that got better. But how to accomplish that was not so clear cut. But hope provided a way. It gave me the courage to face the difficult challenges, the determination to look beyond my current situation, and the strength to hold on to the belief in his recovery, as well as mine. Because recovery isn't just for the person who's ill. It's for the whole family. However, we must get, back, we must get better at recognizing our own limitations and biases about mental illness. We must get better at offering words of encouragement and being a lifeline to those in need. The African proverb 
it takes a village to raise a child is equally true when we think about recovering from a brain disease. It takes an entire community of different people interacting with family members like myself or those with psychological difficulties like my son for healing to take place. Understandably, in the initial months following Aaron's diagnosis, I was more concerned with mending his mind instead of my heart until I discovered that a broken heart couldn't heal a broken brain. I believe there are a lot of broken hearts in the world, each trying to fix themselves or someone else, when in fact we must seek healing for ourselves first. There's something I realized, this is something I realized early on. I was no good to Aaron being in a depressed state. Therefore, I had to get help, and so I did. I also learn how to let go. Letting go of the old dreams to make room for new ones. I had to let go of doubt, disbelief, and anyone who didn't share in my vision for his future. And I had to do this over and over and over again. A couple years before Aaron's diagnosis, I had the opportunity to learn about the meaning of letting go when I participated in a ropes course challenge. If any of you are familiar with ropes course challenges, I thought it would be a fun thing to do, <laughs> as well as it would give me the opportunity to overcome my fear of heights. Not so much. <laughs> the introduction of ropes course challenges begins on the ground level for the purpose of building cohesion, trust, and trust amongst one another before moving on to the high ropes exercises. So when it was time to move on to our first high ropes obstacle, I quickly volunteered to be the first one up because I knew the longer I sat on the ground, looking up at that 25 foot pole that I needed to climb, I knew that I wasn't going to go up it. But I got my helmet on, my harness with the carabiner attached and the safety line running through it. I was ready. I approached the pole with all the confidence and bravado I could muster which quickly dissolved with each rung I climbed up. By the time I got to the top of the pole and stepped out onto this two foot by two foot wooden platforms, I was a quivering bag of bones. I could barely inch myself forward to balance on a two inch cable. I think my foot's a lot bigger than that. The objective was to walk across the cable while reaching for ropes that hung down in front of you. You would get to the other side and your person on the ground who's holding your safety line would then eventually lower you to the ground. It sounds easier than what it actually turned out to be because what I discovered is that in order to move across, you had to let go. You had to let go of what was behind you, which was one rope. They were spaced far enough apart, even with my long arms, that I had to let go in order to reach for the other one. Similarly, this is exactly what I was facing with regards to Aaron. I couldn't move forward in the recovery process until I accepted our re reality and let go of everything I was holding on to, 
which were thoughts about the past or dreams of the future. All I had and all I was required to do was focus on the present moment. To have faith and confidence that everything was going to be all right, knowing that if I fell, I could get back up because of the support I had from others. I cannot say that I was always able to see what I needed to do or know what I was supposed to do, but I did have faith and hope. And as a last resort, I also had my bedroom to retreat to if all else failed. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, also known as NAMI, one in five adults in the U.S. experiences mental illness each year. That equates to roughly 43 million adults, not counting their family members, who need to know that hope exists and recovery is possible. At this point, I think there are roughly 10 people at each table. Can I ask for a volunteer of two people from each table to please stand? Yes, this is an active participation point. Just two people from each table. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. Wonderful. I want everyone to look around at each other and see, how, see what it looks like with everybody standing. You are a small representation of the one in five who may have a mental illness. Please look around this room and see how prevalent mental illness really is. I'd like to thank you for participating, but before you sit down, would anyone, knowing that you are representing a mentally ill person, would anyone like to just quickly share, even in just one word, what does it feel like to know this is what you're representing? Do you have, well, I won't put words in your mouth. How do you feel? People are looking at you. Yeah? It's good that there's awareness out there. That's what you feel like? That it's good that there's awareness? Yes. Okay. And All right. Resources to help. Wonderful. Anybody else? Compassion. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Concern. Concern. Wonderful. Now you may sit down. <laughs> Thank you. No one ever thinks. No one ever thinks that they or someone they love will be diagnosed with a brain disorder until it happens. The odds that Aaron would be diagnosed with schizophrenia before the age of 13 was 1% of 1%. How in the world does that happen? It happens. And when it does, you need, to be a, you need to become a source of encouragement and support for caregivers like myself who are overwhelmed at the prospect of caring for a loved one whose brain is not functioning well. Whether we're referencing neurological brain diseases or psychiatric diseases, it's important we don't lose sight of the human component. It's important we don't lose sight of the human component when we speak in terms of percentages and statistics. Numbers are quantifiable, people are not. The truth of the matter is that many of us fear mental illness, which is why very few people talk about it, seek treatment for it, self-medicate because of it, or isolate to hide from it. I strongly believe if we make the conversation about mental health safe enough to talk about, then those who need care will feel safe enough to seek treatment. As a result of Aaron's diagnosis, I had to become a strong advocate for his care and his education. However, I was not a one-man van. I relied on those in the education system to help me reach the vision 
I had for him, which was to graduate with a regular diploma and not a special diploma. I made sure that I understood what drugs he was prescribed along with their possible side effects. I managed his medication until he could do it for himself. Once Aaron graduated from high school, I knew he would need outpatient services beyond what my community offered. For no lack of trying, there was little available in Manatee County. If you don't know, that's in Bradenton. After a lot of research and phone calls, I made the decision to move our family to Gainesville, primarily because of the services and supports Meridian offered. Aaron has benefited tremendously from being a part of the psychosocial rehab program, from supported employment services to group therapy, meditation classes, cooking classes, and most importantly, the camaraderie he shares with his peers. It has all contributed to his growth, development, and continued recovery. Looking back over these past 20 years, I'd like to reiterate the point that we all share a common thread in my story. While the particulars may be unique to me, the fundamental principles of grief, loss, anger, and overcoming are universal sentiments we all understand. As Napoleon Hill points out, every adversity, every failure, every heartache carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. Therefore, let's not get distracted by the challenges associated with mental illness and miss the message entirely. We are a collective mind, body, and spirit, bound together by the will to live and the will to love. And what we do onto others, we invariably do on to ourselves. Let hope be your compass, faith be your lifeline, and let love transcend your pain. Once again, thank you for this opportunity to share one small story of my experience with raising Aaron. Thank you. Wow, is there anything more powerful than a mom on a mission? I mean, that was powerful, and thank you for sharing that. And, and again, uh, for Alan and Leslie, both of you, another round of applause for their <laughs> words today. The words on mental health, the impact it has on all of us, whether we're diagnosed or we have someone we care about in our lives who suffers with the condition. Now, seeking out care for mental health it concerns is a sign of strength. It's a sign of strength. And there's robust evidence that demonstrates mental health care is effective. And Meridian is here and has been for 50 years, providing that help, providing that hope, which is the antidote to fear. So we're hoping for another 50 years. So we'll all be back right here in 2072, <laughs> one week after Hurricane Kanye came through North Central Florida to delay our, our, our gathering. Now, to conclude today's event, to wrap things up, please uh, please welcome uh, Lauren Cohn to the stage. Lauren is Meridian's Chief Operations Officer. She's worked in the mental health care industry for 15 years, more than 15 years now, and is certainly passionate about developing quality improvement plans and ensuring the best possible client care. Once again, please welcome Lauren Cohn.
Hi, everyone. Um, first and foremost, I really want to thank Leslie for sharing her story with us. Um, it's so meaningful and impactful, and I really appreciate you being here today. Um, I also want to thank all of you for being here today, um, and not just for being here, but for also supporting the work and mission of Meridian. Um, certainly, our mission is not an easy one. Um, it is not for the faint of heart, but it is definitely the stories and help provided to Aaron, individuals like Aaron and families like Leslie's that keep us all hopefully here today and doing the work that we do. Um, so hopefully you're asking yourself a little bit of what can I do to help aside from being, being here today. Um, so we have a few ways that we want to, to highlight how you can get involved. Um, Alan referenced one of them about mental health first aid. Um, so certainly we are available to offer and schedule any mental health first aid courses for you and your organizations anytime. So please reach out to us if um, that's something you're interested in. You will also uh, notice the silent auction QR codes. So that auction, as Dave mentioned, will be up for another week. Um, if you're doing a little Thanksgiving shopping, as you as you indicated after that turkey, um, please feel free, shop the auction. Um, we also have these cards at each station. Um, this card has options for donations and ways you can get involved. Um, so please, there's a QR code. There's also a box at your table. Um, if you would like to um, make a donation, scan or place these in the box. Um, also, just talking about mental health. You know, the, keeping the conversation going in the community, I think, is one of the best ways that each and every one of you can leave this room and help the cause and the work that we do. Talking about mental health, keeping those conversations going, reducing that stigma, that's something easy that everyone can walk out of here and do today and every day. Um, so we're hoping that's what you do. Uh, follow us on social media, um, tag us here today. Um, please, uh, you know, again, I think the more people can talk about it and the support of mental health and mental health services is what we can do to, um, provide the best care possible, like I said, to Aaron and, and families like Leslie's. So thank you again so much. We hope you have a great rest of the afternoon.